today with trends. I think that's the perfect way to set the day. Uh, uh, you will learn all about not only the digital entertainment trends for now and the future, but also how you translate and, and, and actually use that in your own work. So our next speaker will give you a crash course on applying trends with the use of something she calls the consumer trend canvas. S her name is Victoria Foster. Thank you. She's the head of the prestigious trend watching company, which is a really interesting company because they use around 3000 on the ground spotters for watching trends. So that's really interesting. Um, the company doesn't really focus on specific technological novelties, but rather on the consumer's basic needs. Because she says, there's actually a huge gap between what customers want and what they get. So, I think she's really, uh, <laughs> she knows all about what you really want. And please welcome Victoria to the stage. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, I'm going to be giving you a rundown of six of the kind of most important, biggest consumer trends that are going to be impacting the digital entertainment sector for the year ahead and beyond. And also kind of a bit of information about how you can actually apply this to what you do and how you can learn from the trends that you're seeing around you all the time and how this can actually begin to impact in what you do every day. But before we do, I know it's just past lunchtime. You're all probably in a bit of a food coma from the delicious pizza that I can keep smelling where I am right now. So I've got a quick warm up exercise for you. I'm not going to make you all stand up. Don't worry. I'm actually going to present three innovations to you. They're recent innovations that we've seen at Trend Watching, and I want you to really simply think whether or not they are a good idea or a bad idea, and why you think that. So three innovations, a good idea, a bad idea, and why. The first one for you is anyone who has a slight guilty pleasure of eating fried chicken, guilty as charged. This is from KFC over in Hong Kong, and they've just launched edible nail polish. So this is nail varnish that comes in hot and spicy flavor and fried chicken, like original flavor. The idea is when you paint it on your nails, you then lick it and it will taste of fried chicken. <laughs> That's your first one to think about. The second one for you is just an extension of Domino's incredible package that makes it even easier for you to order their pizza. This is the no touch Domino's pizza ordering app. You open the app, and that's it. Your pizza is ordered. The idea is that when you open the app, it gives you a 10-second timer that then counts down. If you don't cancel the pizza order within that 10 seconds, your order's sent. And the app will remember your favorite order, your delivery address, and your billing information. So zero touch pizza ordering. Anyone else think it's a little bit maybe risky if you're sort of 2 o'clock in the morning on your way home, you kind of fancy a pizza? But yeah, that's your second innovation to be thinking about. And the third one is kind of fitting into that on-demand economy, the Uber economy that we're seeing so much of. Now, this is an on-demand scooter app in Italy. And to the kind of mark and coincide with a religious holiday in Rome, where they see 10 million extra tourists come into the city, they launched a service where you can have an on-demand <laughs> priest <laughs> delivered to anywhere in the city. So, you know, should you want a confession, a blessing, or just to kind of have a chat to a clergyman, order your priest, they'll pick one up on the scooter and deliver it to wherever you are in the city. <laughs> so those are the three innovations to kind of kick off and get you thinking about. So we had the KFC edible nail polish the Domino's making it even easier for you to order your pizza, and then the on-demand priest delivered to wherever you are. So let's take a quick vote. Can I just see a show of hands? Who thinks that the KFC edible nail polish is a good idea? Yeah, <laughs> your hands shot up. Can I ask why? It's true. You've got a great novelty factor, right? <laughs> Does anyone think that it is an absolutely terrible idea? It's the worst thing they've seen. Yeah, can I ask why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, it kind of looks like you're biting your nails or something if you're eating the nail polish. <laughs> Very true. 
How about the Domino's no touch ordering app? Does anyone really want this and now want to order a pizza? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I ask why? Yeah. Ah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I know. I should have warned you. Yeah. I, mean, I think it just makes it easier to get pizza, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything that makes that easier is fine by me. Does anyone think that that's a really bad idea? Yeah, can I ask why? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's like if I download this app, I wouldn't trust myself to use it, I don't know, responsibly, but like yeah. it's something I would purposely stay away from because I know what I would do with it. Like. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's true. I mean, sometimes 10 seconds isn't quite long enough if you've accidentally sat on your phone and ordered a pizza like five times. <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. And what about the slightly quirky, shall I say, uh, priest on demand? Does anyone think this is a really bad idea? <laughs> Can I ask why? <laughs> no, I don't know when you would ever need it, but, well, maybe if you're, well, the one you meant to have got sick or something, then it could be good, but, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, very true. Like the need for an on-demand priest has to be quite severe if you need a confession that badly. <laughs> very true. So can I assume everyone else thinks it's a good idea then to be able to order up a priest? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I think it's an amazing PR stunt. I can imagine uh, all the viral YouTube videos, um, yeah. you know, picking up on the internet. And uh, I hope <laughs> it will not cause too many traffic jams, though. <laughs> That's true, yeah, <laughs> all these priests congregating, that's true. So thank you all so much. And I guess the idea of that brief warm-up exercise, apart from sharing some of the more ridiculous innovations that we see at Trend Watching with you, was to get you thinking in a consumer mindset. So these innovations that you're seeing every day that will cross your path, will inspire you, and maybe even overwhelm you by the sheer quantity. Everyone that you see, it's worth bearing in mind that actually to take yourself out of the equation and evaluate it for the good that it can have for a consumer or the needs that it could fulfill for a consumer somewhere, maybe outside of your realm, because actually with all these things, you're not just the only judge of them. And that's really kind of a fundamental statement, I guess, that we use at Trend Watching. So Trend Watching is a global consumer trends agency with our head office over in London, and we scour the globe looking for kind of signs of emerging consumer trends that we then write and report on. And as I kindly introduced, we're powered by this network of spotters. That's about 3,000 people around the world who are the people who send us in the innovations that they see, exactly like the ones I just presented. Those quirky, interesting, unique innovations that they're coming across every single day. And that really helps us spot the directions of where consumers are heading. What are they loving right now? that can then help us see what they're going to be loving in the future. And with all that information, we produce a free monthly trend briefing that goes out to kind of a quarter of a million subscribers and more readers every month. We also have a premium service that our clients dive into when they need inspiration or trends to help energize their strategizing and really begin to plan their marketing strategy, innovation, PR, or products for the coming months and years. And then we do also recently release a book that kind of sums up this whole thinking. But when I say consumer trend, that is sometimes met with some confusion. Are we all about fashion? Well, actually, no. You know, we like things that are a little bit ugly as long as they're innovative, interesting, and unusual. Is it about finance? Is it about those big macro trends, the things that the economists report on or the Financial Times? Well, again, no. You know, they influence what goes on with consumers, but actually that's not the kind of trends we mean. And is it all about what's trending on Twitter or what I'm seeing on my Instagram or that Kim Kardashian has worn that dress again? Well, no, that's not it either. We define a consumer trend as a new manifestation among sorry, among people, in behavior, attitude, or expectation of a fundamental human need, want, and desire. And I probably should have like highlighted it and bolded it, because actually, when it comes down to it, it's just about people. And looking at them and their really basic 
human needs and wants and desires. Because, you know, the world around us is changing at an insanely rapid pace. You know, I don't need to tell you this. You guys will all know the pace of technology change, the pace of, you know, life and urbanization and movements around the world. It's constantly happening. But actually, when it comes down to it, and when you think about people at their basic level and their needs and wants and desires, well, actually, they haven't really changed month on month, year on year, decade on decade, or even century on century. But what does change are the innovations, the things, the products, the services that they use, that they come across that actually help meet these needs and wants and desires, but in better, more exciting, more interesting, and more engaging ways than before. But inevitably, what we find with the innovations that we come across every single day and that you and me and everyone uses, well, some are a bit better than others. And I'm going to hand over to probably one of the best trend watchers I've ever come across, who explains this in a very, very good way. Do you feel that we now, in the 21st century, we take technology for granted? Well, yeah, because now we live in an, in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the, on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots <laughs> that don't care, because this is what people are like now. They got their phone, and they're like, ugh, it won't... Give it a second! <laughs> Give, it's going to space. Can you give it a second to get back from space? Is the speed of light true? Yeah. Yeah. I was on a, I was on an airplane and there was internet, high speed internet on the airplane. That's yes. the newest thing that I know exists. And I'm sitting on the plane and they go, open up your laptop, you can go on the internet. And it's fast and I'm watching YouTube clips. It's I'm in an airplane. And then it breaks down. And they apologize, the internet's not working. The guy next to me goes, this is bull <laughs> <laughs> Like, how quickly the world owes him something yes. he knew existed only 10 seconds ago. Right. So, Louis C.K. is summing up really nicely how quickly our expectations can change once we've experienced that amazing innovation. You know, whether it is getting your hands on the new iPhone, whether it is having high-speed internet when you're up at, you know, 30,000 feet, the, the speed in which our expectations can be changed and shaped, it kind of creates this gap. You know, this difference and this gap between what consumers know they can get, those amazing standout innovations that they've experienced and they know are out there, and then what 99.9% .9 of brands are actually offering them and are actually available to them. And this is crucially what we really, really look for at trend watching. You know, how are these new innovations shaping what consumers now expect from the brands and businesses that they come into contact with? And that's actually why in this presentation and the trends that I present to you, I'm not really showing you that much from the digital entertainment industry because actually consumers' expectations can be shaped from kind of any industry that they in come into contact with. You know, we don't live in industry silos. You know, we don't take our expectations, you know, we carry them with us. When you've experienced, you know, the amazing customer service that happens at the Genius Apple Bar, for example, and then you go to your restaurant down the road and you're like, why aren't they as nice to me as the Genius staff are in the Apple store? The expectations that are cultivated there travel with you wherever you go. So it's always worth bearing in mind, how are the expectations that these innovations are cultivating going to affect your future customers, you, and the kind of innovations that you're coming up with either now or you know, in your future careers. Sorry, that's the slide it should have been. <laughs> so let me move on to the trends that I'm gonna present. So I've got six trends for you. Virtual actualization, intuitive interfaces, live stream prisoners, status tests, taste-led targeting, and true self. And I've kind of bracketed them under three kind of key main thoughts that are really underpinning kind of the changes that are happening to the digital entertainment industry and actually kind of hopefully can help you see how and why that trend could influence then what you create and what you do. And I've popped in a couple of light bulb slides. This is just for you to take a moment and actually think, how can this inspire me? What can I do with this? What can I take back to my tent? What can I take back to my workstation this afternoon? And you know, how can I apply this to what I'm doing right now and see how the expectations are changing for the consumers that you know, I'm currently innovating for? 
So let's get going. The first key thought I've got for you for the first two trends. Stop seeing the world through the lens of technology and start seeing technology through the lens of basic human needs and wants and desires. It's so, so easy to come across and read about and hear about a brand new piece of tech and think immediately, you know, I need to get on this or I need to see how I can use and apply this to my consumers. But actually, if it doesn't really address something fundamentally kind of basic within them and a need that they really have, it kind of becomes one of those sort of throwaway, quick-lived kind of gimmicks, I guess. So I've got two trends that show ways in which brands have really harnessed the power of new technology, but to really, really understand their consumer and get how it can actually really benefit them. So the first one is virtual actualization. Let's start with the stat. So in 2016, virtual reality technology sales will reach $1 billion for the first time. Now that won't be news to you guys, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you will have already tried Oculus or have experienced some kind of virtual reality technology. And this year really is the year for it. I mean, we had Oculus release, and even just this week, Google were talking about their brand new VR technology that they're currently developing. But actually, the way in which we've seen brands and businesses using this technology has kind of, most of the time, it only extends as far as a kind of a PR stunt. The gimmick and the novelty of using and applying this brand new technology. And actually, the way in which we've kind of seen brands positioning this better is really trying to play into one of those fundamental human needs that we all have to better ourselves. You know, that self-actualization. The fact that we all want to be a little bit smarter, we all want to have that beach body ready for the summer, we all want to improve ourselves in some way. So we've seen brands using VR technology to really be able to play into this and actually help improve a person and their health, wealth, and well-being. And I've got a couple of innovation examples of brands who have done this and harnessed this and, you know, inspired to do this in a really nice way. First up was iCarlos. Now, this was launched in um, the Wired conference at the end of last year. And it's a workout machine, which looks a little bit uncomfortable and a bit weird, but you lie on it, wear your VR headset, and you are then doing a workout while you're having a virtual reality experience. You know, it really manages to match that VR technology with actually, you know, making your workout just a little bit more fun and exciting. You know, really helping that beneficial. Next up is actually helping consumers better themselves in a slightly more unusual way. So Toyota over in Japan used VR technology to help younger drivers become safer drivers. So it was this whole experience where young drivers would sit in a Toyota, put on their VR headset, pretend they were driving, and would have constant distractions going on in their VR headset. So their phone would be ringing, their friends would be talking in the background, their favorite song would come on the radio. It would be kind of all these interruptions that are helping to train a young driver to just become better and safer. So again, it's that technology that's actually helping you know, improve people. Next up is Samsung. Now, earlier this year, they launched this in Dubai. And it's all about helping you overcome your really deepest fear with the help of VR. And I've got a video that explains it. You are almost there. 24th floor. My fear of heights started when I was quite young. Looking down, it's just impossible for me. I'm about to try the Samsung VR experience for the first time. I'm excited as well as nervous. To go through my fear of public speaking. Hello, class. Pass or fail is based on several criteria. Oh, my God. It's really scary. OK, I can feel my heart beat. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have to close my eyes. I'm just a bit scared. I fail. <laughs> Oh, I can't anymore. Feeling a bit nauseated. Your heartbeat becoming like you can do, 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 do. to the max. I'm probably gonna black out. It's looking at something that you've never seen before. Be fearless. Each day, they like adding more people. I want to talk about Frida Kahlo. 
Change the level, yeah? Yeah. Congratulations in passing all the levels of Fear of Height. Wow, I got excellent. I flew after so many years. It felt good. This was, wow, a hundred in front of me. I'm really proud of myself. <sighs> it's like you were free. Now, things are different for me. The whole concept of looking down excites me now, and I would like to do it in real. I will just talk, talk, talk. I will try. So every day is going to be a new challenge. <laughs> so you can see how Samsung really harnessed this to actually, you know, really help improve people and build on something. And the final one is actually taking this idea of bettering yourself in a slightly different direction. So this was a campaign launched by the United Nations Millennium Campaign. Um, and it was for the UN conference at the end of last year. And it was all about trying to build empathy within the delegates. So this particular conference was really, really trying to focus on the refugee crisis and you know, the plight of refugees coming from Syria. So they created this immersive reality uh, situation that all the delegates were placed in, where you saw firsthand what it was like to live in a refugee camp in Syria. So that idea of using virtual reality to actually try and build up empathy within people is, you know, it's a very interesting kind of technique and way in which you can harness this technology. The next trend that kind of plays along this idea of actually using technology to actually, you know, really, really help fundamental needs and wants is something called intuitive interfaces. So we all know that technology really enriches and kind of creates better entertainment, but it also gets in the way. So now, new and innovative technologies, think speech, gesture, touch, sight, and more, are enabling consumers to interact in ways that suspend disbelief. You know, consumers around the world, and you know, we're included, are kind of faced with this sort of paradox. We are so reliant on technology and the amazing power that it gives us for information, you know, the amazing kind of freedom and accessibility that it gives us, a media on demand. But yet, it is incredibly distracting. And it's kind of quite detrimental to relationships, to productivity, to communication, creativity, and more. I mean, just think about the amount of times that you were having you know, drinks with friends and most people around the table were sort of glued to their smartphones. So you can see how this kind of tension's created and this way in which it actually creates this kind of dilemma, I guess, for consumers. So we've seen this whole kind of raft of brands and businesses come in and really use technology, but the, to kind of liberate consumers from that screen, to be able to integrate it more naturally into their day-to-day -day life and actually be able to kind of enhance their experience and enhance the ease in which they go about everyday life. So the first example is Amazon's Echo. I'm sure some of you have heard of this. This is a voice activated box, I guess, that you place around your house. And it has a virtual reality, sorry, virtual intelligent assistant called Alexa, who's voice activated. And you can ask her pretty much anything and she'll do it. So it's, you know, ask her from what the weather is to put items in your shopping basket on Amazon. You know, it is that voice activated personal assistant that I'm sure many of you and me included have always wanted. But now at the beginning of this year, Uber have also been integrated into this platform as well. So if you want to order an Uber now, all you need to say is Alexa, order me an Uber and she'll do it. So it's that kind of ease of interaction and ease of technology in your everyday life. The next one is from Live Tim. Now, this is a mobile operator in Brazil. And they've created a way in which to help people who are blind or partially sighted be able to use uh, emoticons and emojis in a more intuitive and natural way. So they've equated every emoji with a sound. And it's on a desktop application. So every time either you want to send or you've been sent one, it plays a distinct noise. So it enables you to kind of interact with that whole element of technology, but in a just a much more succinct way. But obviously, this kind of technology can be used for a slightly more fun, a slightly more frivolous kind of way. It doesn't always need to be necessarily about helping people. And that's exactly what we saw from Spotify at South by Southwest just a couple of weeks ago.
experience of being able to sync through technology can just you know, become natural, can become effortless. And the final example I've got of this trend is something I've yet to make my mind up on, but it's called Imacit. And it was Kickstarter funded just a couple of weeks ago. And it's embedding and entertainment enhancer, I guess, into your everyday surroundings. Let me show you their video as well. They are little hydraulic um, devices, I guess, that go underneath your sofa and respond to the sounds and motions going on in the show that you're watching. So if you're in a fight scene or you're ch being chased by someone while you're watching TV, the sofa is moving as it would in the film. Not quite sure how you cope with that if you've got a cup of coffee or something similar, but you can see how technology is seamlessly you know, being used in a different way to enhance a digital entertainment rather than getting in the way of the experience. So I guess the thought of that is actually how can you yourself, when you're looking at the applications of various technology, how can you look just beyond technology for technology's sake and think how can you use this to really enhance something deeper within consumers? The second key thought for you Content, content absolutely everywhere. That won't be news to any of you guys. The absolute insane amount of content that is available online is just overwhelming and always increasing. So actually, for brands, in order to kind of grasp hold of consumers' attention, they need to become just a little bit more demanding of it. And the first trend that really underpins this is something called live stream prisoners. So at the end, well, Throughout last year, we saw the explosion of online streaming platforms. You know, online video streaming platforms, I should say. You know, whether that's Meerkat, Periscope, Instagram, allowing longer video clips on their platform, it is just quite insane, the amount of video that you can now see. And in fact, 40 years of live stream footage was watched every day by 10 million Periscope users by August 2015. So that was when Periscope was only a couple of months old. So how can brands cut through this and actually begin to grasp hold of consumers' attention to pay, you know, actually make them watch what they're doing? Well, the way in which we saw a lot of brands responding to this was something that we called live stream prisoners. And that was all about brands forcing consumers to do some kind of participation, some kind of physical participation in order to get access to the content. And the first example of this is from Mark Dorsell. And I will just very simply hand over to the video because he really does explain it better himself. Le buzz de la semaine, eh bien oui, car l'industrie vie a toujours un coup d'avance pour ce qui concerne les parties Bainen et Marc Dorsel. Marc Dorsel, the undisputed king of adult films in Europe, has a problem. Sex sells, but sex is hard to sell. Because online, everyone gets it for free. So, why would people pay 9 euros and 99 cents a month for Mark's high quality streaming adult films if they don't see what high quality actually is? That's why Mark decided to give him exclusive free access to his entire library. But under that one little condition to keep their hands on the keyboard. Presenting hands on. People loved Mark's offer. They loved it so much that they tried hard to 
put their hands to use again to hack it. Vous lâchez et vous pouvez profiter du film en illimité de tout. I think the Kiwi hack is probably my favorite out of them all. But you can see how they try to, well, force people to actually watch their content by actually forcing some kind of participation. Reebok did something slightly more gimmicky, but slightly similar over in Singapore. So they, yeah, Singapore. Um, so they made people wear Reebok trainers, moviegoers who are in a cinema over in Singapore. And in order to continue to watch the film, someone had to get up and run on the treadmill. They had to try out and test out Reebok's trainers in order to actually power the film to go. And you know, you took it in turns of audience members trying to actually run to keep this film going. But again, you can see how that physical participation, that physical interaction into something that is online or live streamed is that kind of key hook that consumers had. And the final example I've got of this kind of idea of actually captivating people's attention by that physical participation is something from this Polish nonprofit run by Heart Foundation. And they wanted to encourage young people in Poland to actually get out and exercise and keep fit. And again, their video kind of sums this up really nicely. This is Susie. Susie, like more than 50% of her friends, doesn't do any exercise and nothing in the world could convince her otherwise except maybe her favorite band. We got the Run With Heart Foundation together with Poland's biggest music labels, Warner, Universal, and Sony, and found a way to encourage teens who never run to do so using the power of music. We created a platform where teens can listen to new music tracks, but on one condition. The song only plays when they're actually running. Moving Tracks is a simple mobile site that recognizes when you are running and then plays you an unpublished, never heard before track. But if you stop, the music stops too. Some of Poland's most popular bands and artists made Moving Tracks the first place to publish their new songs before they could be heard anywhere else, giving teens an incentive to go for a quick run in order to be the first to hear them. And what I really like about that example is it's actually really encouraging very good behavior. You know, you're actually sort of forcing someone to get out onto the street and start exercising, which is, you know, quite a good sort of benefit of a similar kind of campaign. The second example I've got of how brands are really almost demanding consumers of their attention and demanding that kind of participation is something we called status tests. So for a very long time, you know, we've observed that actually there's been the shift away from owning physical possessions and getting your status through what you owned, you know, having the right car, having the right designer bag, to actually being gaining status from the experiences that you had, whether that was going to the right restaurant, you know, working out of the most amazing co-working space, going on that amazing Instagrammable holiday, you know, it was all through those experiences that you cultivated that really managed to gain your status. But even that has now become just a bit more democratized. And actually, consumers are able to collect even more experiences. It's constant, it's overflowing, it's overwhelming. And especially the exception of this online content. You know, you can now, you don't have to be at these events to be able to witness them live. So the way in which we saw a lot of brands kind of tackle this and regain some of this exclusivity is again, demanding that consumers participate and almost pass this test before they can actually even get access to the products or services that the brand wants to provide. It's kind of bullshy for a brand. You know, you have to be slightly confident if you're willing to put a test to your consumers to be like, you need to pass this before you're gonna even get access to it. But we saw it pay off and the brands and businesses that took it under. So the first example of that is from 1930s bar. And this is an exclusive speakeasy in Milan that has a very, very strict door policy and they created quite a unique and interesting marketing campaign that really plays into this idea of testing consumers. And again, let me let this 1930 again. is the most exclusive and inaccessible speakeasy bar in Milan. 
Many would like to get in, but only few have the privilege, because the door policy is exceedingly and humanly strict. So, how could we recreate this very strict selection online with the first door selection on Tinder? It's like real life, but worse. Selection starts here, with the profile of a girl from 1930. Court me like they used to do in the old days. And moment after moment, I may let you in my heart. Give her your heart, and if it matches, you can begin a formal courtship. In the first week, we had more than 4,000 matches. To each one of them, every answer was always the same. Wait a moment. And the moment, as in the seduction of olden times, is an handkerchief falling to the ground. Will the curtis says the moment and continue the courtship. A selection by seduction starts. Of the first 4,000, only 800 correctly picked the handkerchief. Of these 800, only 300 picked up another handkerchief. And finally, one moment after the next, an handkerchief after another, only one will remain. The only one who matched all seduction rules with today's digital lifestyle. The only one who has earned the privilege of entering the much desired Kurt and Love 1930. Results. Highest online door selection ever. Lowest real life conversion ever. 1930. Seduce it online to be accepted in real life. Maybe. Quite an interesting test that they put and placed on the people who wanted to go to that bar. The next one is Uno and NYC. And this is a Brooklyn based uh, radio station. And they play like local artist music and especially new fresh releases. And they created a campaign that meant that you could only listen to that radio station when you were actually physically on the Williamsburg Bridge. So the only place that you could hear this radio station and the new exclusive music that they were playing was in this very location. And the idea was that on the way into New York, you got like a really kind of motivating pump up kind of song. And on the way home again, back to Brooklyn, you got a kind of more relaxed, more kind of going home sort of song. And again, it's that test. You know, you've got to be there at the right place, at the right time to be able to access this kind of content. And you can see how that level of exclusivity cultivated around this can really kind of inspire and shape what consumers expect. Another one is from London. Now Marmite is kind of a sandwich spread, I guess, that people seem to either love or they hate. People are very polarized about this, and especially in the UK. And they created a pop-up store in the center of London. And they had, a, again, quite a strict door policy. You had to be a lover to be able to get in. But it wasn't necessarily a lover of Marmite. It was actually done by if you were generally a nice person. So when you wanted to go into the sh shop, you had to give up your social media handle, either your Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. It would then scan all the comments that you'd ever posted and decide if you were a positive person or a negative person. If you were a negative, you weren't allowed in. And if you were a positive lover, you were allowed into the pop-up shop. Again, that kind of test of character, I guess, to see if you were actually worthy of entering the store. And the final example of this kind of test is from Netflix. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Netflix one touch and chill button that they created, where it was a single touch button that consumers would make in order to be able to have one press of a button that would turn off their phone, order their favorite takeout, turn off the lights and turn on Netflix. And this was a continuation of that. Let me show you what they did. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I'd love a pair of those, but the way in which they involved the test in it was that you had to make them yourself. You couldn't buy these socks just anywhere. It was in order to actually get access to it, you had to be savvy enough to knit your own socks 
and then also develop your own chip that was going to do that based on the patterns that they made available online. So it was quite a nice test in order to reach that status of being that Netflix superfan. So I guess the light bulb moment for that is actually how can you really think about embracing this quest for status that consumers have and this newfound status that they want to gain from the experiences that, that they have. Now the final key thought I've got for you and the final two trends are all about how consumers maybe aren't behaving quite as they should. So women over, under, sorry, women over 18 now represent a larger proportion of gamers than boys under 18. Maybe not something you kind of really expect, right? You expect a stereotypical version of a gamer. Only 40% of US adults aged 18 to 34 consider themselves part of the millennial generation. So that's 60% of people who should be millennials don't actually think they are. And Netflix. This is great. <coughs> Todd Yellen. And he is quoted as saying, there are 19-year-old guys who are watching Dancing Mums, and there are 73-year-old women who are watching Breaking Bad. Again, neither of those people you would expect to be watching those kind of shows. And I think Tom Yellen, Todd Yellen even hit, it, hit the nail on the head, really, that actually people want to be defined by who they are and not this demographic cliche or this demographic category that you would expect them to fit into. Because we've seen this shift away from people being and fitting to those stereotypical clusters and those stereotypical demographics that you would expect them to, whether that's age, gender, income, region, religion. People are freer than ever to actually construct their own identities. They have access to unlimited and untold influence from around the world, and they can pick and choose. You can be who you want to be and be the kind of own identity that you choose to be. So now that we all kind of have this added freedom to actually not necessarily be targeted just for those demographic statuses that brands think we should be, how can brands begin to target consumers as an individual rather than as this bucket of people? And the first way in which we saw brands doing this is something we call taste-led targeting. So brands are moving beyond this one-size-fits-all demographic model and actually intelligently using AI, data, past actions, or current tastes to learn about their customers and actually target them as an individual. It's all about intelligently using data and actually you know, finding out who a customer really is before you target them. And Iberia did this in a really nice way. So this is the Spanish Airlines, and they created a promotion for based on your Spotify playlist. They would scan your Spotify playlist and give you a discount on a flight to a place where the kind of music that you like would be played. So if you were into dance music, you'd get a discount on a flight to Ibiza. If you were into techno, you'd get a discount on a flight to Berlin. It's all about your music taste rather than who you are, where you lived, or your age, or your gender. Spotify, they again do this really nicely with their Discover Weekly. If anyone here has used it, it aggregates everything that you've listened to in the past week and sends you a created list of fresh music based on your past listening patterns. Really simple way in which they're using data, again, just to target what you like and what you listen to, whether it is your guilty pleasure tracks or whether it is something a little bit cooler. Prism. Now, this is a Kickstarter-funded device that was launched actually about quite a while back in 2014, but it's just become available now. And it's a little device that connects to your speakers and then connects to your smartphone in via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. And it learns your music taste and your music preference over time from your Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, you know, kind of whatever streaming platform you use. And will then create a list, again, and learns your likes and dislikes and recommends you music. But what's really nice about this device is it actually has an unlimited amount of devices that can connect to it at the same time. So if you're having a party or a group of friends over, it then connects to all the devices and will find music to suit everyone's taste. It's kind of a nice way of you know, really including everyone's taste into um, the evening. And the final one of this idea of actually targeting people to their tastes was done by Skoll. Now this is a uh, Brazilian beer brand. And they created this event for 5,000 people for Rio Carnival. <laughs> Oh.
custom fit mask and embedded them with uh, MIT technology that used people's Facebook profiles to find them their perfect match. So it had this little green light and if it showed that your Facebook profile had compatibility with the person listed next to his Facebook profile, you'd see a green light and it would know that they're your perfect match. And if it wasn't, you'd show a red light so you knew to steer clear. Again, that kind of interesting way to show that you could use your old past tastes and your preferences that are available online to actually kind of facilitate something in the real world. And the final trend I've got for you goes one stage further than this. It's called true self. And actually going beyond just using people's past data and their past preferences and their current tastes, actually we've seen a ream of brands almost uncovering something quite hidden about people and using their subconscious and emotional response to things that maybe they don't even realize they're doing to actually customize and make something very, very bespoke for someone because 53% of consumers are willing to share personal data in re return for tools that help them make a decision. So why not have emotion as one of those kind of bits of data? The first one is Smile Suggest. Now this is a bookmark, um, sorry, a Chrome bookmark. And it uses your camera and rec facial recognition software. And when you're looking and like, you know, you're browsing the internet and you smile at a web page, it automatically bookmarks it. Really simple way of reminding you actually what made you smile, what made you laugh, and reminding and saving it for later. Bentley also did this in a slightly more high-end way in being able to customize your cars based on the reactions to a series of images. something that's completely yours, completely spoke, spoke to you, but again, uncovering something that maybe you didn't know about yourself. Now, Massive Attack, they launched, with the release of their EP earlier this year, they launched an app called Fandom. And it's a way in which you can not only access their new tracks, but you can also personalize them to you. So into the app, you could remix their re latest releases, but all based on your personal data. So it works on your location, your movement, your balance, even using the camera, it could tailor the track to your surroundings and also link up with the Apple Watch to be able to tailor a song to your heartbeat. So it's like a completely fresh, brand new track that's just for you based on your own personal biometrics. And the final example I've got of this is not necessarily a complete innovation, but almost just a piece of tech that I think is kind of quite interesting and quite inspiring. So 20th Century Fox, in the release of The Reverend, Earlier this year, you know, that epic biopic film where Leonardo finally gets got his Oscar for. They had a movie cinema filled with people who were wearing tracker wristbands that measured their heart rate, their sweat, and their body temperature, and actually tracked people's reaction to the film, but their emotional reaction to the film during the performance. And I think that's, I mean, that's just a really interesting piece of tech to almost leave with and leave you as that thought light bulb moment, I guess. Actually, how can things be customized, even movies, be customized to people's personal emotions and reactions? So that gives you kind of a rundown of the six big trends for digital entertainment at the moment. But, you know, watching trends is great. It's nice to know, you know, you can hear about them and then you can leave and it's, you know, they just kind of fade into the distance. They actually become really powerful and really interesting when you actually apply them. 
and actually learn from the insights and see how you can apply them to your own innovations that you're coming up with. And we have this tool called the Consumer Trend Canvas, which is available online. And it's just, I guess this is the best image I can find that kind of sums up what it does. It almost just puts things nicely together for you to unpack and analyze and use a trend to be able to come up with some innovations of your own. Because exactly as I said at the beginning, you know, change is absolutely everywhere. But people's basic needs and wants and values don't really change. It's all about that innovation inspiration that you can then use to apply to the own things that you are coming up with. And crucially recognize where that expectation gap is. What are consumers expecting now because of what they're experiencing already? And that, I guess, is essentially the first part of the canvas. You know, really digging into what are the bases of the trends. And then it's all about thinking, where can I apply this trend? Where can I apply these insights to my own brand or business or project that you're working on? And also who? Who can it be most beneficial for? And who can really, really respond to this trend and these insights? And that is just the other side of it. And then, I guess, it's over for you guys to then come up with the innovations that match. So that is everything that I have for you today. And yeah, if anyone has been inspired or has seen any of the innovations that I've presented and thought, you know, I saw something similar and I'm inspired by them, then, you know, we are always looking for an amazing spotters to join our network to send in innovations just like those. So yeah, thank you so much. And there's a few minutes if anyone has any questions. Oh, definitely. <laughs> well, thank you for these trends, and it's really interesting because this is a this is a tech conference. But always keep in mind that it's not about technology; it's about experiences, and that whatever you me make should resonate with these basic needs and wants and desires. Does anyone have a question for Victoria? Because then I can hand over the mic. Something that you want to know more about? Something you feel? That's not enough <laughs> touched upon. <laughs> I can give you the mic, otherwise I'll, no, I'll ask you a question. Yeah. Because I, with all these digital experiences, basically, and, and, and you see that brands actually have now a physical representation in the room, like Amazon Echo and Google mm. Home, I think also. Um, how do we make sure that, because we're human beings, we like to touch things, that, how, that, that we still fulfill that basic need of touching, etc., with all the digital experiences out there? That's a yeah, very good question. I, I mean, I, th I think it definitely comes through that experience angle. And actually, if it is all turning digital and online and technology driven, actually, does the physical come in con like human contact? Is that actually the need that we're almost driving towards? Is it becoming less about, you know, the tactile things that you're touching and actually the communication and that side that you're now then going to be relying on? because you know, technology is only gonna become more and more entwined with our everyday life and almost less and less tactile. So actually, does it just kind of move beyond that? I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Anyone from the audience a question? Well, they, uh, they're blown yeah. away, I think, with all the examples <laughs> and all the trends. Email me <laughs> if anyone's got any questions afterwards. I'm yeah, definitely. Um, um, we are back at three, I think, at this uh, stage. And then we have a set about gaming. Really interesting speakers. So please join me again at three and uh, have fun until then. Thank you. <laughs>